Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Laura Ashram, and I'm the Chief Executive of the British Neuroscience Association. And I'm delighted to welcome you to this special webinar with our partners, Milteni Biotech, on 3D imaging of entire brains with light sheet microscopy. We'd love for you to get involved in the conversation today. So do say hello in the chat and let us know where you're dialing in from. We'll have time for speakers to our, um, we'll have time for questions to our two speakers at the end of the webinar. So if you've got any questions, do pop them in the Q&A section and you can submit your questions at any time, but we'll get to them at the end. I'd like to take this opportunity to remind you that this webinar is being recorded with the permission of our speakers and it will be available to watch on demand on the BNA's YouTube channel at a later date. And finally, please remember to adhere to the BNA code of conduct for webinars and engage respectfully online. So without further ado, I'll hand over to our first speaker, Jack Grimes. Jack is a fluorescence imaging specialist at Milteni Biotech and will introduce our session today. Over to you, Jack. Great, thanks for that, Laura. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's good to see you all. For anybody who doesn't know me, one sec, I'll just share my screen. Uh, hopefully, everyone can see that. Uh, I'm Jack Grimes. Uh, as Laura said, I'm the imaging specialist here for the UK uh, for Milton Biotech. So, I cover our uh, light sheet microscope and our spatial biology platforms. Um, Laura, can I just confirm you can see my slides? Yep, we can see that. All good. Fantastic. Okay, so today you've got me speaking to you, so I'm going to chat to you about the ultra microscope blaze. Uh, so for anybody who didn't attend BNA 2023 this year or wasn't able to attend our silent symposium, um, I'll give you an overview just of the microscope, its capabilities, and some of the things we can do related to neuroscience with it. Um, and then we've got a speaker, uh, Christina, who I'll introduce afterwards, who's at the University of Edinburgh, uh, who's actually using these microscopes in addition to other tools for her research. So the first thing I always say about this is um, today I'm not going to speak to you as much about the image analysis side, but that's actually my background. So my PhD was more on the uh, biophysics of microscopy and understanding image analysis. And with these light sheet microscopes, we can create very nice renders and 3D renders uh, of data, which look good for a cell or nature cover. Uh, but we can actually do some really powerful analysis with these as well. So if anyone's interested in that, uh, please get in contact with me afterwards. And so can... So just a little agenda. Um, so I'll give, a, as, I, as I mentioned, a recap of the Blaze uh, from the BNA this year, a bit of an overview of the system for anybody uh, who wasn't familiar with it beforehand. Uh, I'll then talk about some neuroscience specific applications that we use the microscope for. And then lastly, I'll be unveiling some very exciting new developments. Uh, so this is the first time that these have been unveiled in the UK. Um, last month, uh, we unveiled these at um, SFN um, over in the US. Uh, so you guys will get the privilege of seeing that first. So what actually is a light sheet microscope um, and how is it different to traditional microscopy? Um, so if we think of a, a wide field microscope where we have a light source of some kind, this could be a laser or a mercury arc lamp, uh, we filter light through a dichroic and all of that light goes through a lens. We then have our sample at the bottom where we collect the light, photons uh, are released where everything gets excited, and then we can capture that through a camera or uh, our eye through a viewpiece. The problem with this is it's got no real inherent Z sectioning or Z capability. Everything we image, we're going to receive, and that appears as a blur if we've got a very, very thick sample. Uh, there are some imaging techniques such as confocal or multi-photon microscopy, which get around this by using a, a pinhole, for example. Uh, but the problem here is we get lots and lots of out of focus light and unnecessary illumination, uh, which effectively means that either we're imaging the samples too slowly for large samples, um, or we're photo bleaching everything. So light sheet um, in principle has been around for some time and is actually quite simple in terms of how it images. Um, effectively, what we do is we decouple the uh, illumination from the detection optics. We use a cylindrical lens, which creates a very, very thin sheet of light. And then we can scan the sample through that sheet of light and we collect everything with a really, really big objective uh, through our camera. So the way that I think of it is effectively like a, a microtome, it's an optical microtome. And if you look at this video here, you'll see exactly how the light sheet is producing data. Um, so we pull the sample through it, we generate each of those 2D slices, and the important thing with light sheet is every single thing that we capture, um, we, everything we image, we capture without losing really any information. 
And it kind of bridges this gap. It is a microscope, but I call it, it's in the, the mesoscopic range. So of course we'd love to have the, the resolution of something like a confocal microscope. And actually with the light sheet, you end up getting around half of the lateral resolution of a confocal. So still very good uh, considering we're looking at very, very large samples. Um, and things like an MRI or a micro CT are what you traditionally use to image something such as a whole brain or even a whole organism. But of course these lack in terms of resolution. So this kind of fits inside of that scale where we're able to look at the very, very large samples, but also get a really good resolution. Now, of course, not just mice, but also brains, and to a lesser extent, things like organoids and spheroids are opaque. So how do we actually image these large structures? So this is a little experiment I do still get in the lab, and this one just happens to be my kitchen um, with my cat's laser toy. Uh, so why are tissues opaque? If we take a glass of water on the left-hand side, and I've just shined the laser toy through it, um, the light has an unhindered path, so we just see the interfaces between the glass and the water. However, on the right hand side, I've put a couple of drops of milk into the water. So this is adding proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, a bunch of different molecules which effectively scatter the light. And instantly now we can see the light path and it's been scattered and we lose intensity. And the more and more opaque this comes, the more and more we um, can effectively see the scattering of the light's path. So the aim is to effectively get our tissues to the left-hand side, so light has an unhindered path to travel through them. And this is exactly what we do with tissue clearing. So there are tons of different ways to clear tissues, and throughout my career, I've done pretty much all of them. Um, one of the nice things I always say about Milton is we offer the whole workflows, but you're not beholden to them. Uh, so we do actually have a really nice, easy to use uh, tissue clearing kit. So if you're new to tissue clearing, or our tissue clearing with solvents and want a, a really easy way to automate the protocol. This turns it, I would say, more into kind of like a cryogen mini prep. Um, and effectively what we're doing here is refract, um, refractive index matching. So all of these things like proteins and lipids and carbohydrates have a similar refractive index to the tissue. So light has an unhindered path. And this is what that looks like for a brain hemisphere here over a period of around six hours. Total protocol with things like staining and stuff like that, you're looking more in the range of kind of seven to 12 days. Uh, but we have a range of protocols for things like organoids, brains, livers, spleens, kidneys, all that kind of stuff. So on the left-hand side, this is what I would say half of my PhD thesis looked like and is, I would say, a common problem with uh, imaging very, very large samples is how do we get antibodies throughout the sample? Now, if you're doing a cryo section and you're used to working on, say, an eight micron section, the antibodies don't have very far to travel. But even something here with a, you know, an organoid, which is just a couple of millimeters, um, the antibodies have really got a long path to get through. So if you're not staying in for long enough or you've not validated or optimized your antibodies, you end up with this kind of classic halo effect where we don't get the staining effectively through the full sample. What we want is something like the right hand side. So as I said, we do the whole workflow. So we actually have a large array of antibodies and a lot of those have now been validated for 3D tissue. Some of those you can see here, so they go through from spheroids to brain organoids, cancers, lymph nodes, lungs, and brains. Um, and there's really a variety there. Um, in particular, because we're speaking with the BNA today, a few that I would mention, which are really, really good and I've had good experience with, are uh, the parvalbumin, tyrosine hydroxylase, MBP, which I know Christine has used as well, um, neurofilament, there's really a range of antibodies there. So just get in touch and we can send you that list. So I've spoken already about the immunostaining and the antibodies that are available, uh, the tissue clearing itself. Now let's have a little chat about the microscope. So at a glance, what is it that the ultra microscope blaze is really doing? How is it unique? And how is it pushing the limits of light sheet microscopy? Because that's really what I would say it's doing. Um, the first is the capability to image very large samples. And I think perhaps more importantly, the able to, uh, ability to increase your throughput through imaging multiple samples. So you can see on the right hand side here, so this is from Ali Ertek's lab. So he pioneered a lot of the kind of tissue clearing methodologies and he uses our microscopes over at the Helmholtz Institute. And you can actually see that we can fit a whole mouse in here. Um, this is using our XXL chamber, which is on the bottom here, but effectively we have a cubette and the light sheets come in through the left and right hand sides of the cubette. I'll just play that one more time so you can really see uh, the sort of travel range we have here. Secondly, uh, we have the capability to load multiple samples, so doing these kind of batch measurements. So here we've got an embryo, a lung, a heart, a paw, a few different organs on there. And the real key is that 
this microscope has been designed even more so than the predecessor microscope. We had the ultra microscope too, which was a little more finicky to just kind of sit in a facility. Users can come. I can train someone to use this in about an hour or so and have them running samples on their own. Effectively loading samples, you either glue or you screw the samples in place. And then effectively you just pop them on the microscope, close the door, and then start imaging. So this has been sped up. Of course, we bring the objective down to the samples. But you can see what that looks like here with the samples just moving through those very, very thin sheets of white. The really nice thing with this, with the batch imaging, um, is that you can basically set up every sample completely differently. So if you've got different lasers, different exposure times, different settings in Z that you need for each of your samples, you can completely customize that as well. Next, fully automated. I mean, you still do have to do stuff on the Blaze, but it is very automated, I would say. And there are a few different ways that we, we have this kind of ease of use functionality. The first is actually loading samples on, as you just saw, it's super, super easy. You basically just have to pop them on top. It takes 10 to 15 seconds. The second is there are a range of objectives on there. So we have three objectives, which are on a turret, a 1x, a 4x, and a 12x, which I'll go into detail a little bit later on. This effectively means that as a user, you can do your own view scans, and then you can do your very, very high resolution captures, and um, basically with just a single mouse click of moving the objective. Um, we've also got automated focusing as well, and this can be done chromatically uh, by moving effectively this whole imaging frame uh, on the top. And we can image thus with things such as four or five, all the way through to 785 nanometers. One point I'll make on that is I would say with light sheet microscopy in general, uh, we want to redshift as much as possible. The, the blue wavelengths scatter light quite a lot. And if you've got a very, very large sample, it's quite difficult for those blue wavelengths to really get in. Um, for things like organoids, it's not so much a problem, but it's something to consider if you're thinking of doing light sheet microscopy. And if, for example, looking at whole brains, for example, things like DAPI just probably aren't going to cut it. You'll maybe want to move to things like cytox orange for nuclear stains. So in terms of the optics, I've just put one slide on here really just to show the lenses and I'm a little bit of a microscope nerd. So of course I have a favorite lens and the 4X kind of fits, I would say in the range of still getting very nice cellular resolution whilst also providing a very large working distance. So the working distance is the distance that we need to be from the, the sample itself um, for imaging to occur. And that's almost two centimeters on the 4X. Um, the other really nice thing about this is we have a bunch of different dipping caps. So depending on the type of clearing that you're doing, whether it happens to be solvent based, aqueous, or even, for example, doing live zebra fish in water, all you have to do is unscrew the dipping cap and pop a new one on. So it really offers you some flexibility, for example, if you're a facility manager who's looking for a microscope which can effectively image everything. So what sort of resolution can we get? It's around 500 nanometers, as I said, laterally. That really depends on the, the wavelength that you're using and how well your sample's cleared. Uh, but what you can see here is just a, a 500 micron Z stack of a mouse cortex on the 12X lens, just really so you can see exactly the sort of resolution that you're able to get with this. Next, of course, um, neuroscience actually ends up being for light sheet, I think probably 60 or 70% of what we do followed maybe by immune oncology and developmental biology, but really the bulk of the work on these things happens in neuroscience. Um, you can see on the left-hand side, so this is some um, injection of a gliomal cell line and then labeling with CD4, CD8, CD45 or CD31. Uh, we've actually done four color experiments of these. So there are five lasers on the microscope, so you can do some really nice multicolor experiments. Um, in the middle, we've got some work on neurodegeneration. So this is something that's been actively worked on at Milton as well. Um, so this is some plaques in mouse brains, which have been labeled with thi one And on the right-hand side, this is a labor of love for me because I spent a lot of my PhD looking at mouse, um, mouse hearts. And um, this is CD31, so one of our antibodies, uh, which is labeling a whole brain here, uh, studying stroke occlusion models. So you can see how that vasculature changes um, after an induction of a stroke or a traumatic brain injury, for example. And for neuroscience, as I said, it's a lot of what we do. So if you scan this QR code here, I will also publish the slides afterwards so you don't have to scan it now. And we've got a really nice up-to-date list of all of the references which uh, these microscopes are being used for in and outside of the UK. So if anyone wants to scan that, I'll give you the chance to do so now. Otherwise, just wait for the slides. 
So lastly, before I go on to Christina, who's got a much more interesting talk than me with lots of real research, um, I just want to show you how we're kind of continuing. One of the things I always say about Milton is they kind of innovate like crazy. So not only do they build the microscopes, we then like to kind of push them to their limits. Uh, and this is one of the ways that we're doing that. So one of the common things we tend to see, I mean, we're imaging very, very large samples at very good resolution. This takes time. Um, so one of the things we've been working on after kind of hearing back from the field is increasing the speed. Um, so I'm going to unveil the new speed modes, which are in the process of being released now. So if anyone in the chat has an ultra microscope currently and hasn't heard from me yet, you'll be hearing from me soon to talk about upgrading your system for this. Um, and what we're actually seeing is an up to 60 times increase in speed on the microscopes with this. So it's really taking you from potentially multi-day imaging down to just a couple of hours. And secondly, it will be available as an upgrade to any UM blazes which are currently in the field and any new UM blaze will come automatically with the speed mode. So the reason why it's a little slower at the moment, what we're currently doing is we actually move the optical housing of the light sheets to scan the full sample at the best resolution. So physically the mirrors are moving, which is moving the optical housing, which takes some time. What the new speed mode does is effectively we keep the light sheets completely static and we create a numerical aperture dependent ROI around our field of view and the light sheets are fixed and we move the sample through that. So we're just capturing a part of the camera chip. And if we actually do that with continuous drive of the stage with the shutter of the camera, we can see some really, really big increases in speed. And then we just need to stitch all of these uh, numerical aperture dependent field of views together at the end. And this is what that looks like. So for a real speed comparison, so you can see a brain hemisphere here. So this is labeled on the, the 12X, around 70 tiles at six microns in terms of thickness of the light sheet in Z. And you can see all of those details here. Previously on the older version of the blaze, this would have taken you around 15 or 16 hours. With the light speed mode, this goes down to 18 minutes with no compromise in resolution or anything else. And I'd be happy to show anyone uh, further data on that. We've really been working to stress test it to check that this works perfectly and it really does. Uh, so you can see that kind of change in speed increase there. And secondly, just to show you what that sort of resolution looks like again on a brain. So this is a, a labeled with two antibodies. So this is our TH570 and our NDP667. Again, two color experiment on the 12X objective for a whole mouse brain with two channels. Um, and you can see we go from around 27 hours here to just 37 minutes. So if anyone's interested in the speed mode, please get in touch with me afterwards. And for my final slide here, any further information can be found. A couple of links will be posted through the chat anyway. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A zone. Um, but my colleague Hazel will also be posting some links. Um, but you can also just pop onto our website into Max Imaging and Microscopy and then go to the Light Sheet section. And you'll find there a bunch of brochures, application notes, reference lists and webinars. And um, feel free to peruse. Thank you. So what I'll do now, um, my screen share is off, I'll introduce our next speaker, uh, who is Dr. Cristina Martinez-Gonzalez. Uh, so Cristina did her PhD in neuroscience at the University of Oxford with Paul Bolam's group. Uh, so this was looking at neuronal activity in rat models of Parkinson's disease. Uh, she then joined as a postdoc in um, Gregoire Cortines lab at the EPFL in Switzerland, where she worked on rodent models of spinal cord injury and how that translated to humans and also actually visited uh, Carl Weisroth's lab over at Stanford to learn more and become more of an expert on tissue clearing uh, using methods like Clarity. Um, so I work with Christina now, so she has one of our microscopes and she's a postdoc um, over at the University of Edinburgh and is studying neuronal activity deficits in rodent models of autism spectrum disorders. So I'll hand over to Christina now. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> I am gonna start sharing my screen um, I hope it all goes okay or oh, maybe I didn't yeah. right can you see my presentation yep. I hear me great right well thank you very much for the invitation for this uh, webinar I would like to talk about uh, Rad Disco, which is a novel immunolabeling and clearing pipeline for large rat disco brain, uh, for large rat brains. And um, right, we 
currently work in the field of neurodevelopmental disorders, but the main aim of my talk today is, um, well, the main aim of the entire group we're working in is to understand the brain function, but using unbiased three-dimensional mapping, or basically mapping the structure. And we're interested in to map neurons, connectivity, vasculatory, at the whole broad um, brain level. However, uh, with the current anatomical tools, it's pretty much nearly impossible. The current methods used at the moment are manual sectioning of the tissue, followed by manual quantification and of, 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 neuronal, of, of neurons and uh, atlas registration, with finalizing with manual cell counting or stereology. All this process, of course, is very time consuming, it's very laborious, and the problem is we always lose information. By sectioning the tissue, we lose, we can damage, we can reduce artifacts, etc. Hence, we need, to, we need to see the structures in 3D rather than in 2D. And why imaging in 3D is important, and this is an image that uh, actually we came across through Jack. Uh, I need to get out of the mode too, so few people can see the videos. This is a piece of art called Squaring the Circle. If you only look structures in one way, you miss the, the full picture. Basically, if we just cut the sections of the brain in coronal, sagittal, horizontal sections, we're always going to miss information. So it's quite important that we could acquire the full picture. And for that, light microscopy is actually ideal. Briefly, I'm going to do this for in, in two minutes because Jack make, made a very good explanation of, of light microscopy in general. But basically what it consists is to run, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but if not, you can see an horizontal, uh, la very thin sheet of light through the tissue that is detected by an objective located orthogonally to the plane of, of light. This allows, um, well, basically produce very little photo damage. We can image uh, live organisms. It produces a very large field of view and produce a very fast speed of, of scanning. However, well, using this kind of, uh, oh, sorry, I'm gonna show you. Using this technology, we can enable the full picture, the three dimension of the, the structure in the brain. And this is an example of a transgenic line expressing GFP in the adrenal cortex that for about a year I spent sectioning in every possible angle, corona, sagittal, horizontal. And as you can see, the projections from here in this area, which is the adrenal cortex, go around the hippocampus, go up again and innervate the thalamus. This is impossible to visualize in 2D and obtain the whole picture. In one hour of imaging, clearing this tissue, I could basically I did had a much better idea of, of the structure and the projections and the connectivity of this tissue than in, in one hour of this and a whole year I was working with this structure with, with these animals. However, to be able to use light shield microscopy, we need to optically clear our tissue. And as Jack also briefly touched on this, Light sheet microscopy requires the tissue not to be transparent, but optically clear. And what does it mean is basically removing the lipids within the tissue and then use refractive, a refractive index mat matching between our tissue and the imaging media. And this is a nice example of the disappearing beaker in which we can put a beaker inside another beaker. And if we match the refractive index of the glass versus the media, we can make the, tissue, the, the glass inside disappear. This is what we do with our brains in our clearing protocols. We made them optically transparent, but we preserve the proteins of interest inside so we can detect them. Um, there are at the moment nearly a hundred or so clearing methods described for 99% uh, mice and human. Basically, they are divided in three large groups, hydrophobic, hydrophilic and the tissue embedding hydrogel strategies such as clarity. 
Our method that we developed, RADDISCO, is based on the hydrophobic family DISCO, in which, very briefly, they're really efficient and they're really fast to clear compared to the hydrogel methods. For example, Clarity can take six months or so to clear a rat brain. In these methods are much faster, did involve removing the lipids within the brain by using solvents, then immunolabeling the molecules of interest or proteins of interest, and finalizing with a refractive index ma uh, matching. The, the huge advantage of these methods is that we can repeat imaging. Once we image, we can come back with the same, uh, the same uh, brain five years later and re-image another part, and the, fo the fluorescence is pretty much intact. However, the tissue can become very fragile with the current methods. Also, the native fluorescence is bleached. We cannot use transgenic animals for this approach. It needs, it's a mandatory thing to add, add antibody labeling through this, um, at the end of this process. Otherwise, uh, the transgenic the fluorescence, endogenous fluorescence is gone. It has a bit of the tissue after this is dehydration, lipid removal and matching. It suffers through a little bit of shrinkage, but it can be an advantage because our main interest is to work in rats and rat brains are much bigger than mouse or organoids. So a little bit of shrinkage helps to put it under the microscope. And as I mentioned, out of these hundred methods or so currently described, there is only one described for transgenic rats. As you know, there are very few transgenic mo rat models compared to mouse models. So for us, it was incredibly important to obtain deep antibody labeling in a large rat brain. And why are we using rats instead of mice? Well, basically they are, have a much more complex uh, behavioral and social and cognitive uh, behaviors. In the group where I am, uh, we are focused on studying uh, autism spectrum disorders. So for us, making these protocols, creating a protocol ideally for the rat was incredibly important. The challenge with the rat, as I say, the tissue is much larger. Hence, the antibody penetration can be poor. Uh, there are, as I said, very few transgenic rat models compared to uh, mouse models. So we definitely need a very strong and very reliable antibody labeling. And finally, there is, and the analysis is very difficult. Until very recently, there were no three-dimensional atlases for the rat, three, uh, rat brain compared to the alien brain, uh, alien brain atlas for the mouse. Hence, we developed uh, this methodology, which is called RAD-DISCO. RAD-DISCO uses an antigen retrieval to enhance antibody labeling. So we pre-process the rat brains, the tissue. We're using SDS or sodium dodecyl sulfate, which is soap, a sulfactant, to denature proteins. We incubate the brains in a alkaline pH and we treat it uh, as heat with heat. Uh, we, we give it a heat treatment for about an hour. And after that, we take the tissue for the methanol dehydrations, in this case, uh, rehydrations to permeabilize the tissue and create a mild fixation of the proteins remaining in place. We do immunolabeling um, of the molecules of interest. And finally, we remove the lipids using solvents. We take that tissue to do um, light sheet microscopy, and currently the microscope that we have is the Ultra Microscope 2. However, I have a couple of examples of images that I'm going to show from the Blaze. Um, right, with Rat Blisco, we achieved the tissue uh, high transparency. This is an image of how uh, an hemisphere of a rat brain looks before clearing. After the Rat Disco protocol finish, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but can see my mouse, yeah. Can you see the mouse? Yes. Ah, okay, well, then I, I missed, I ignored that bit. <laughs> um, so the rat disco brain, this is how it looks like. You can see through relatively well. It, it achieves a high level of transparency, and we compare this with another protocol currently described for mouse only, which is iDisco Plus, which is one of the most used methods around. The tissue is also relatively similar in transparency. Our tissue becomes a little bit more amber-like compared to iDisco, but I can show you in a, in, a, in a few slices that that doesn't change any aspects of transparency. 
And we try other common methods out there, especially TDE, or just in embedding the tissue in ECI, which is common for small organoids without any of the processing steps. And you can see the tissue doesn't really render transparent. So we compare now only our tissue treated for rad disco compared to iDisco Plus. Um, we took the brains to, uh, to measure the light transmittance. And this only means how much of the light, depending on the color, will pass through the tissue and how much we could see afterwards. So if we take the brains of rad disco and basically pass through wavelengths between in the in the range of the green color, the red color, or the far red color. iDisco Plus does a little bit better in the level of transmittance at the lower uh, at, at the green side or higher wavelengths. However, the more we move to the far red, Rad Disco overtakes in iDisco Plus in the level of transmittance. And we haven't done this in the colors and Jack mentioned, a much higher wavelengths, but the results will be even better then. So as Jack mentioned before, with light in microscopy, you want to move to the red spectrum because it's the light will diffract much less in those frequencies, in those wavelengths. Hence, red disco seems to be giving us a, an advantage in the higher wave, in the longer wavelengths. Um, as I mentioned before, all the uh, uh, solvent clearing methods shrink the tissue. And we compare our Radisco method with iDisco Plus. Our method, Radisco, shrinks the tissue approximately 25% compared to, in our hands, 8% from iDisco Plus. However, this shrinkage is isotropic, the same as iDisco. We measure this by taking these brains before and after clearing, and we measure the shrinkage in the rostrocaudal axis, the mediolateral axis, and the dorsoventral axis. And you can see uh, uh, this, our rad disco shrinks approximately 26, 25, 26, and 23 percent. It's really isotrophic in the way it shrinks compared to iDisco Plus, in which shrinks a little bit different depending on the angle of where you're looking at the tissue. So in our hands, as long as it shrinks homogeneously, we were happy that um, we stick to that. And as I mentioned before, rad brains are massive. so. A little bit more shrinking allows the tissue to fit in, in any microscope, well, it, it, easy to fit under the microscope. Also, we compare Rad Disco with iDisco Plus in how deep the antibody actually penetrates in the tissue. As I mentioned, our method is designed for large brain structures, while iDisco Plus, it was designed for mouse, much smaller structures. So here you can see a whole brain uh, but I forgot to mention, none of my images are cut slices. Every single image you will see through my presentation is an optical slice, meaning that you will basically, it's an optical slice at this level, in this case, Bregma 2.9 millimeters, but of an entire right brain or a whole, or, or at least a half hemisphere of a right brain. So this is how it looks like in the middle of the tissue. I'm not sectioning anything. This is uh, immunolabeling against FOXP2. You can see is a, 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 all these FOXY2 positive neurons in the cortex and in the striatum, well, caudopotamen. And we compare this with iDisco Plus. As you can see, the iDisco Plus doesn't really penetrate so well, at least for this antibody. And we tested for some, perhaps, but the large majority don't work as well. It's in the rat as it normally does in the, in the mouse. But maybe I should go back. This protein that I'm showing you here, FOXP2, is a constitutively expressed protein. And as I mentioned, we are interested in measure not just neuronal types, but actually neuronal activity. So we choose for this CFOS as a marker of neuronal activity because it's expressed rapidly and transiently throughout the brain. And um, is used as a, as a proxy of neuronal activity. This particular image I'm showing you here was acquired with a Blaze microscope and is the CFOS immunolabeling through the entire amygdala of the rat. Um, in this case, it's a control animal, but a little bit later I'm going to mention why we're choosing CFOS because CFOS is, as I mentioned, rapidly expressed in conditions, for example, fear condition, in this case, the amygdala in behavioral um, fear paradigms. 
So we were very happy with the mineral labeling of Hifos in the middle. And we ask ourselves the question, can we detect changes in neuronal activity using, in our case, which is the most one of the most popular uh, models of autism spectrum disorders, which is the frial x rat And we measure, we wanted to detect these changes of CFOS activation or behavioral, uh, of neuronal activation using a classic behavioral paradigm. Our aim was to map and quantify these behavioral activating neurons in control animals versus the fmr one rats. Um, we have the tools to do the antibody labeling through the entire rat brain and the entire amygdala. However, the analysis at the time was not available. There were no analysis tools for register light shift microscopy or three-dimensional data rat in rats. So we went and created a custom-made 3D rat atlas of the amygdala specifically for light sheet data sets. And basically we use the Paxinos rat atlas and we created a template in 3D, in 3D using uh, two types of software, commercially available, we use Fiji and for our three-dimensional in one single go uh, atlas, we use Aribis for this to create every single subdivision and registration of the uh, amygdala. I think I had to come out of my presentation and show this again. Ah, yeah, this is gonna be interesting. <laughs> I cannot show the video, but it's all right. It doesn't matter. That's the video of my Atlas, but it's not gonna run. Is anyway, um, we have the Atlas now of the amygdala and we went to validate if we, uh, we could count uh, manually and automatically to avoid having to quantify thousands and thousands of images with the same software. And we were happy with the quantification. As you can see here, this is the raw data images, how the labeling looks like compared to how the machine counts the signal. And we compare this quantification between human and machine, and we were very happy to have exactly the same or very, almost the same matching between human and software. So we have the tools to quantify behavioral activated neurons in the amygdala. We have the atlas to do so. And we chose a very simple behavioral fear paradigm, in this case, food shock, in which we have animals that we were naive from the cage. We took them, we perfused them 90 minutes after that. To, um, we, we perfused them straight from the cage, sorry. And then we have the animals that went over behavior, animals that were put in a cage and show a flashing light and perfused 90 minutes after that, or animals that were put in a cage, show a flash of light and given a mild food shock. We use the tissue to clear using rat disco. And this is how, again, these sections look like. These are not histological to these sections. These are snaps of the amygdala in the three-dimensional space. This is how the, rate, the data, the raw data actually looks like. This is a raw image with just an inverted, uh, inverted color in, in Fiji. You can see wild type animals in which the CFOS expression is very low in the naive condition. The animals are happy in their cage, no fear whatsoever. When the animals are put in a cage and given a flashlight, you can see the animals in the wild type animals having a little bit of response to it in terms of the number of CFOS activated neurons compared to the FMR1 rats that they don't seem to be very well aware that they've been moved to a different cage. And when we put them through a food shock stimuli, you can see the inductions of CFOS in the amygdala. This is our quantification of the levels of CFOS density, in, we are talking about cell density, not cell total numbers, that we were able to match with, um, uh, to compare across animals with our atlas. And what you can see is the expected levels of CFOS in naive conditions up to food shock compared to the ephemer ones in which we can see the level in the, 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 when we put animals in the boxes, they don't seem to be very well aware of it, it seems to have like a, behavioral deficit in there. However, when the stimulus is very strong, they both react similarly to the food shock. And as I mentioned, the atlas that we created was very detailed and allows us to differentiate the different parts of compartments of the amygdala in which the CFOS expression was happening. As you can see, the, all the induction of CFOS expression was due to the basal and the vasomedial amygdala. 
while the central and the lateral uh, complexes of the amygdala were not activated, which actually fits very well with the literature um, in the field. So we were very happy that we were able to use this uh, rad disco to map behaviorally activated neurons. However, we realized that rad disco was incredibly good to label not just CFOs. You can see here CFOs in different um, brain in different brain st structures. In our case, amygdala. We look other very deep areas such as the periaqueductal gray. But we took rad disco and we test a whole battery of antibodies. In this case, I'm going to show you some examples that label the entire brain. Uh, for example, FOXP2, another transcription factor. And here you can see a close up in the right panel of the globus pallidus and the amygdala. And other area around at the bottom of the nearly the spinal cord, the inferior olive. In the panels below, you can see CTIP2, another cortical transcription marker, heavily expressed in areas such as the medial and terminal cortex and the, corte the entire cortex itself, but also expressed in areas such as the amygdala, for comparison. And here, the internal cortex. You can see the very nice delineation of um, superficial versus deep layers. And again, these are not 2D slices. These are optical slices of my tree, a whole uh, rat brain or at least a half hemisphere. We also use rad disco to uh, map uh, glia populations. In this case, it's an antibody against GFAP. And we have tested the uh, antibody from Milteni as well. Um, I, I think this is the GFAP. We also have IBA1. And we also have markers for vasculatory, which is in this case ISO before. And this is a lectin. This is not an antibody. So this is a lectin labeling, but we could label not just neurons, but also glia and, and blood vessels with rat disco. Rat disco is not just for the rats, it's actually compatible with the mouse. And I'm just putting here selected examples of transcriptional markers such as MECP2, CFOS, and uh, not, uh, a, an enzyme marker of dopaminergic, adrenergic, and noradrenergic neurons, such as tyrosine hydroxylase. Uh, with Radisco, we could also map neuronal projections that has been labeled using viral constructs. In this case, it's an animal in which we injected a virus in the medial entorhinal cortex. And you can see here the projections, the injection site, and the projections from the entorhinal cortex around the hippocampal area arriving to the dental gyrus. So it allows to map not just neurons, but glia vasculatory and projections. And finally, rad disco is compatible with in-situ hybridization. Uh, we tested RNA scope for this, and we label uh, parbalbumin positive, uh, a, a parbalbumin um, probe in the cortex. Here you can see at the top the visual cortex, and here in this area the medial and terminal cortex. And we have a control probe just to show the expression without um, of the or of, yeah a positive control probe there. Um, just to summarize, but I want to come out of this again. Yes, just to summarize, I want to show that that disco is compatible with uh, allows in deep antibody labeling in the structures brain structures in the rat and in the mouse. You can label a huge battery of neurons, and this protocol, our RADISCO protocol, is compatible with all the antibodies that Milteni has for light sheet microscopy um, standardized, uh, optimized. We can label glias, we can label vasculatory and projections. It's, we also produce the tools to map and register uh, neurons in the specific areas of the brain. It's quite low cost and robust and reliable. Um, basically allows to map yeah, change the neural activity and that's it for me thank you very much i just want to thank kenste Craigie, which is the senior technician in the lab who works with me we're a team of two women band as i always say and we work on the professor manolan's um, lab in the simons initiative for the development brain at the university of edinburgh thank you great thank you very much for that christina um, I think what we'll do before we go to the chat, I'll maybe ask a question myself of you first. Uh, so what's next for Rat Disco then? What are your guys, I guess, future plans with it? What are our future plans? Well, we are currently working into 
establishing a couple of uh, first a center of excellency, hopefully, of flagship microscopy here in the north in Edinburgh. We uh, have established several collaborations with people from the autism field, but we want to open this community to the entire, the entire of the UK. So we will try to um, optimize. We have them protocols for rat, mouse. Currently, we also have organoids, and we hopefully try to get several fish soon. So yes, mapping neuronal connectivities, pathways across the brain in different models. And yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, perhaps maybe just one other one for me, because this might be beneficial, I guess, for people in the chat who are maybe thinking about doing tissue clearing. You know, you mentioned with clarity, it can take quite quite a long time. What what would you say are some of the other kind of key considerations when you're looking at, you know, you've got a piece of tissue and you want to clear it? Like you said, there's, there's so many out there. There's hundreds of protocols. How do you pick? So many of them. Um, if you... I would recommend the clearing with solvents in a way, because is much faster than the hydrogel or the water-based approaches like clarity can take very long time these solvent-based approaches produce a, a tissue that in the end it looks like amber like is solid so you can go and reimage as i say five years ago once you had put the antibodies they don't get bleach ever you could image and image and image days at a time yeah. however if you try to clear with clarity or other uh, uh, water-based mediums, the tissue expands and it's okay for a few days or weeks. The, after that, the tissue collapses, the structure literally deflates and gets absolutely flat and tissue would not last long. It, you cannot go back and reimage. So I would suggest solvent-based methods. It might take anything for a couple of days to perhaps three weeks. Radisco takes three weeks, mostly because the antibody um, Incubation can take one week primary, one week secondary. And we are working, as you know, with Milteni to use your antibodies because they are coupled primary and secondary with the fluorophore. So we don't have to, we, if we use those antibodies, we don't have to wait those two weeks. And our Radisco protocols reduces quite a lot time wise. But I would suggest stick with these clearing, uh, solvent clearing methods. Yeah. Yeah. And at this kind Whenever of. Whenever possible. Yeah, this actually relates a little bit to to one of the the questions I think in the chat as well. So so Rosie said, um, I may have missed this, but could you tell us if autofluorescence or transgenic GFP could be amenable to light sheet methods, or if you need to use a different clearing protocol? And and this is actually something that comes up for the the solvent based approaches a lot, right? Is this you dehydrate with ethanol and it can quench GFP? There are some ways around it. So I'll I'll post a link in the chat to to one of our protocols about tertiary butanol. Um, using that instead of ethanol, which overcomes mm -hmm. that sort of the GFP. But I don't know if you have any other suggestions. To keep the fluorescent intact. Yeah. Uh, if you've um, got some transgenic fluorescence, for example, because this is where some of the non-solvent based approaches can be beneficial yes. in my experience. Um, it can be beneficial, but you can bring the bag with antibodies. And it's, it's really, if you use a smaller structure, you can label with antibodies in an overnight or two days such as the same as a normal immuno in 2D. So yeah. I think that could help. I, people think sometimes adjusting pH can keep the GFP in place. Yeah, pH, pH is another one. Yeah, I, I agree. Adding an antibody is a really good way to do it. And autofluorescence, it, it can be your best friend if you're interested in looking at just the global structure, but it can be your worst enemy as well, I would say. So yes. it, it really, I would say, the 488 channel is one of the most careful considerations, right? To think of what to, to put on it, depending on where your tissue water for us is, of course. But, yes. Yeah. What we do actually for our transgenic injections, for our transgenic animals and our injections with a virus carrying GFP, we actually use the antibody against GFP and the secondary infrared. Mm. So move yeah. the green to the far red, and that gives a much more nicer and crisp signal. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Um, Okay, question from Max is, are you planning to do uh, a whole rat brain atlas using light sheet imaging? Uh, well, no, and I can't tell you why. <laughs> uh, if you don't mind, I share the screen. There is someone who already done that. And it's a whole group in, the, in Oslo, in the entire of Europe, is called the eBrains. Is something like the Allen Brain Atlas Institute in the States, but for in this case, they do it for mouse, rat, and monkey. So they had already created a whole three dimensional atlas 
for the rat brain in which you can semi-automatically register the data, semi-automatically or automatically quantify the number of neurons and map it to everywhere. This is actually an example of our data of CFOS activated neurons in the entire rat brain. And you can tell it maps very well. It needs a bit of optimization, but in general, it's, it's, it's free software. It's, uh, you don't need coding experience. You need to do three lines of code, and that's it. However, for example, you can see in here in blue is the amygdala. It's not very detailed. You can get the neurons in the entire amygdaloid complex, but not what is the VLA, what is the central VLA. So for us, that was the limitation. And you can have the entire cortex, but you cannot determine layer specific things. So uh, I think those guys are doing a very good job on that. And I will just use their tools whenever suit me. Yeah. And I think on that that image analysis side as well, it's so useful to have tools like I mean you'll know light sheet analysis can get quite complicated and stuff. And I think even yes. people who have coding experience, like keeping it simple, I would say is the best way to go. Is uh, the best so that, yeah. And with them, we actually, in collaboration with this group in Oslo, because we are giving them light sheet data sets and they are registering in 3D because they originally developed this for 2D. So it's, it's, it's for uh, taking a whole brain atlas approach is better to yeah. collaborate, I think. Yeah. Okay, so we've got another question from Rosie and this maybe comes a bit back to the, to the antibodies. So can you tell us a little bit about the different antibodies and how they behave using these methods? So if you're someone who's, for example, doing a lot of histo, with cryo or wax, Will the antibodies there be suitable for light sheet or is there anything special that you need to do for antibody labeling? Buffers? We haven't noticed anything special. Often if it works in 2D, it will work in 3D. And normally the surprise is I will test even antibodies that you have in the fridge, they don't work in 2D because the extra uh, permeabilization in 3D no, sometimes brings better. The, it, antibodies don't work in 2D, sometimes work in 3D. But the other way around is not. If it doesn't really work into the very well, if it's not a transcription factor, well, I won't, I don't know. But they don't have anything special. We have tried several companies, Abcam, Thermo Fisher, Swant, everything. We have tried quite a lot of the Milteni antibodies because they are a couple with a color and they're fast in one go. But for something, we have tried a huge variety. Yeah. And yeah, maybe, maybe it's well on to that. So. Not yeah, I agree. Special. I think I think doing the having them primarily coupled to a fluorochrome, what it saves you time, so it can take a time. while to stain these, right? But also, I think there's the consideration that if you think about as your antibodies getting depleted as it comes through, effectively the thickness of the tissue with Brownian motion, when you're having a a primary and a secondary, those sparse antibodies have got to meet each other. So, yeah. So, I mean, you can definitely use primary secondary pairs. So that's one consideration. If you can couple it, great. I think another thing is if it's ethanol sensitive, so if you're doing solvent based approaches, if you've got an epitope, which is, you know, sensitive to ethanol, that's maybe something to consider. A lot of these approaches delipidate the tissue as well. Mm. So if you've got something which is in a lipid raft or something like that, that could be sensitive. But in general, like Christina said, just in my experience, most of the time you chuck an antibody that you've got in the fridge in there and it, it works because of the permeabilization of the tissue. Yeah. Yes, because Red Disco uses three types of permeabilization. The sodium dodecyl sulfate, the protocol itself has triton, and another protocol is a saponin. Yeah. Plus, we open the tissue with temperature and pH, like yeah. is commonly done in 2D histology, the antigen retrieval methods, and that really helps, especially for transcription factors. Yeah. Um, but of course, no antibody is bulletproof. So for that, we attempted the uh, in situ hybridization. Yeah, for sure. And, and nothing else works, go for an in situ, even though it's a bit more tricky. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But if, if you're interested, uh, Rosie, in testing out any of the multi antibodies, yes. just get in touch and you can try them out. But as Christina said as well, if you've got a really good antibody in the lab, use that, I would suggest first. So, um, okay, we've got a, another question. So, do you provide trainings for clearing methods and imaging with the light sheet microscope? And if yes, how can we make this possible? coming to your team as a visiting researcher, for example, I would like to learn on site and translate the methods using the microscope in our research center. Um, uh, yes, in a way. We are at the moment drafting the manuscript, but anyone who sent me an email, I'm happy to send you the preprint and the, the, manu the protocol in itself, not just for the antibodies, but also for the in situ in and the rat clearing method, if you want. And as I mentioned, we are 
attend, we are creating a new light sheet microscopy platform in Scotland with different uh, centers here. So we're going to start doing uh, courses of optical clearing, and, uh, immunolabeling and imaging the next year. But if you just want advice right now, I'm very happy to send you. My, uh, my email, maybe I should put my email there. Um, and just please feel free to email me about that. And we have to share protocols at, with anybody at any time. Perfect. Yeah, and I guess same for us. So on that side, um, you know, we do tissue clearing workshops, that kind of thing. We collaborate with researchers as much as possible. You know, people like Christina, who've got a wealth of knowledge from years and years of tissue clearing. And, you know, these things aren't necessarily trivial, like things like rat disco, you know, previously clearing rat brains wasn't something that was easy to do. Right? It's a tough piece no. of tissue to do it on. Um, so we do also run tissue clearing workshops as well. So we do those in the UK, we do them across Europe, and we also do them on site as well. And this tends to be kind of a more generalized approach to tissue clearing, really understanding the concepts of it, how it works, how to practically to do it. And not just with our kit, but with tissue clearing in general, and also yeah. sometimes on experience with the microscopes as well. Um, yeah, and, and if anybody wants to send us tissue, because we are going to provide a service very soon about clearing methods, uh, you can send us the tissue and we can process the whole tissue for you, image it and even analyze it. Or you can come and visit the lab and we're going to establish like it's going to be an, 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 uh, a core facility. So we will be happy to help anybody. And uh, yeah. I would suggest people take up that because that's <laughs> if I if I had access to that during my PhD, I would have very much utilized that. <laughs> yeah. Great. Fantastic. Uh, looks like there's no other questions in the chat. If anybody else has any other questions, feel free to send uh, through to the BNA or one of us directly as well, and we'd be happy to answer them. So uh, thank you everyone for joining the webinar today. And yeah, as I said, hope you all found it useful. And if anyone has any other questions. Uh, please get in touch. Yeah. Anything else from you, Christina? No, no, that's it. Please get Great. in touch if you have any questions. And thank you very much for listening. Great. Cheers, everyone. Bye. Goodbye.